Welcome to FYI, the four-year innovation podcast. This show offers an intellectual discussion on technologically enabled disruption, because investing in innovation starts with understanding it. To learn more, visit arc-invest.com. Arc Invest is a registered investment advisor focused on investing in disruptive innovation. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. It does not constitute either explicitly or implicitly any provision of services or products by ARC. All statements made regarding companies or securities are strictly beliefs and points of view held by ARC or podcast guests and are not endorsements or recommendations by ARC to buy, sell, or hold any security. Clients of ARC Investment Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Nice to meet you, Jared. I'm Sam. Uh, I'm an analyst at ARC. have been here seven years focusing on automation, energy storage, and space exploration. So, you know, very excited, very excited to have you in. And then Brett, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure, I'm, I'm Brett Winton. I direct research for ARC, so I direct the whole team. Uh, and we also have a, um, you know, we focus on the stuff Sam talked about as well as gene sequencing and editing, AI, neural nets, uh, blockchain, cryptocurrency, and, and digital wallets as well. So very nice to meet you. You overlap on a couple of areas with us. Yeah, I think we do. It's a pleasure to meet you both. And then, you know, Jared, maybe maybe we can dive into your background some. Obviously, I think you're still on the stage of a lot of kids' hopes and dreams as, as an astronaut and, you know, as the commander of the Inspiration4 mission, you know, orbiting Earth. You raised, I think it was, you're over $250 million for St. Jude's Hospital now. Uh, and you're also the founder and CEO of Shift for Payments. So, what what other uh, resume titles am I missing there? No, I'm. I, you 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 you've nailed it. I'm uh, super fortunate, very lucky. You know, basement startup that probably should have gone nowhere when I was 16 turned into a great business, and um, never obviously thought I'd have an opportunity to fly a spacecraft in orbit. <laughs> you know, these were just, you know, I guess that incredibly lucky things to have uh, come about. And I think you got a one up on on the college dropout because you you did it in high school, so even earlier. My parents did require me to get a GED, and uh, I did wind up getting my college degree uh, much later on. So um, I'm not a not against the uh, you know well paved path of higher education, just maybe on a different sequence. That's all. And so when did your journey into uh, aerospace start? When was it you started flying and that got you into it, or? Was there there's something before that? Yeah, I mean, I always loved aviation, and I was a space enthusiast since I was a kid, like five years old. And when I started uh, Shift 4, uh, there were a couple mornings where I was just waking up on my keyboard in the basement, and um, I was actually burning myself out at you know, like 20 years old. I mean, and then, but it was like a couple years deep into the, into the company, and I was like, I need to have a hobby so I went back to flying, and I, I never stopped. And it went from, you know, something that was purely therapeutic, uh, like flying at night just to clear your head, and it became, um, you know, like a passion where I started, you know, doing record flights. I did uh, flew air shows for a number of years, and then started a defense aerospace company, you know, which grew to be a, a pretty decent-sized business. And then, um, you know, it reached its kind of pinnacle just five, six months ago when I um, was able to fly on orbit. So it's kind of the aviation history. You can't presuppose that there's going to be an option to go into space, really. Did the opportunity just present itself to you? And you're like, okay, yes, this is something I'm going to do? Or, or like, how, how long from kind of, hey, this is something that could happen to, hey, this is something I'm going to make happen? What was that time horizon like? So, I mean, I, I really love challenges I, in life. I'm, and um, when I get some momentum at something, I kind of continue to ratchet up. And uh, so I actually never thought flying in space would ever be possible. Like, I, I, you know, you have a better chance of being struck by lightning than becoming a NASA astronaut. So I just sought out the most demanding flying I could. Ex-military aircraft, air show flying. I flew in a civilian jet demonstration team. You know, we flew seven fighter jets, like, 18 inches apart. And then, you know, turned into a commercial adversary business where, you know, we had 100 fighter jets, and our job was just to play the role of you know, Russia or China or Iran, just constantly simulating the bad guy, you know, in real fighter jets for the, for the Department of Defense. I thought that's as good as it's ever going to get. And I'll tell you, it's pretty cool. It wasn't, you know, really until 
you know, the commercial space industry started to gain some momentum that I was like, well, maybe there's a chance. And I kept, you know, my eye on it. I went to Baikonur in Kazakhstan to see a Soyuz launch and just periodically checked in, you know, with, with folks like, like SpaceX. And then October uh, 2020, you know, Inspiration4 was born. And, and I can tell you how that call started and how it essentially ended, not how I thought it was going to go. Uh, it was very surprising. So that's kind of the story. Well, how did you think it was going to go? And, and then how did it go? I was just trying to get allocation and investment round at SpaceX. And I was shut out. And I was, you know, just trying to establish some, I don't know, credibility. I was like, hey, you know, maybe someday when this whole thing opens up, um, you know, maybe I'll be a customer. You know, I'm, you know, I've got a pretty big aviation background and, and I love what you guys are doing. And I did not get in the round, but I, I did get to create Inspiration4 and that was pretty awesome. And then they let me in subsequent rounds. Wow. So they really turned the table on you there. They... <laughs> Total dream come true. Right? That's amazing. And then, you know, for that first mission, how into the weeds on the engineering side did you get? Did you want to, you know, get as involved and learn as much, I imagine, with the aerospace background as you can? Or was it more, okay, we're going to focus on this, the fundraising side, the story, the inspiration, and then... You know, it sounds like the Polaris mission, you know, which we can go into is kind of diving into more technical sides of it. Yeah, it's the answer is it's all of the above. So deeply involved on. Well, first, like right from the start, once I knew that this was going to be the first time, you know, a world superpower didn't go to orbit. That's a huge change. I mean, that is the first step towards opening up space for for everyone. Like I knew we had to we had to get that right like that. That was not going to be taking your, you know, your friends up. You want, you know, the crew, you know, you, you wanted to assemble a very inspiring crew, each with their own audience, um, you know, that could send a message as to what's possible. There had to be a charitable component to it. I mean, it's, you know, it was very obvious that if you focus exclusively on the space aspect of it, um, that you were, you know, ignoring, you know, some of the hardships that are here on Earth for something that is really expensive and could be a very valid argument. So, Right from the start, I mean, literally within a day of it, it was we're going to bring in a, a longtime partner of Shift4, which is with St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. We're going to have a huge charitable component to this because, you know, this is an extraordinarily grand platform where you could really make an impact. And then we set about kind of assembling our whole crew. So the philanthropic aspect of it, the inspirational aspect was a, was a huge component. It was so important because if you really screwed that up, you could set back, you know, public support and progress for future space exploration. Same time, like I am a pilot and um, I, I deeply wanted to be involved in kind of the whole mission architecture, what we were going to do. There's a reason why we flew uh, past the space station, you know, went farther into space than, than those had gone in a long time, uh, because I thought it, um, you know, it signified all the things to come, like getting back to the moon and, and ultimately going to, to Mars and beyond. We spent six months in training on systems related to Falcon, Dragon, you know, nominal procedures, contingency, emergencies, flight physiology, space medicine. Uh, and I loved every bit of it. Not to mention just getting up close and learning from like one of the most innovative organizations in the world. Their philosophies, you know, uh, their values, you know, how they execute with urgency. They do it different than others and they achieve things others could only have imagined. So I loved that education. And I tried to take a lot of that back to my day job too. Yeah, that's a, that's going to be my follow up question is what are the the tangible things you took away from SpaceX and are trying to bring to either ship for or, or just your own personal life? Yeah, I mean, three three philosophies that we incorporate in our ship for way is, um, you know, get flat, stay flat, having a flat organization structure. I mean, I think SpaceX has five vice presidents for 10,000 employees. Um, you know, helps with decision making, aligning responsibilities for accountability, good information flow, taking out the parts. You know, the best part is no part. A lot of people think that's a, like a component of a machine. It's, it's everything. It's the number of pages in a PowerPoint, number of words in an email, the number of steps in a procedure, number of bank accounts, number of Slack channels. I mean, you can go on and on, but like parts are costly. Um, you know, they come with an opportunity cost. They can, you know, be a resource drain. That's kind of somewhat of like the, Cort the Cortez-like model they have of burning the ships to build a better future for tomorrow. And then, uh, you know, executing with urgency. And you can do that when you're, when you're very procedurally driven. Don't waste brain power, uh, you know, figuring something out that you already learned previously. Proceduralize it, optimize it, automate it. There's just so much about, um, 
you know, how they go about doing things that, you know, is, it's impressive every single day that I see it and I've, I've been exposed to it for, for some time now. It seems like, I mean, I, I think everybody looks at what SpaceX has done to the space industry and recognizes, and what Tesla is doing to the automotive industry, recognizes that, hey, from, if you're building an organization from the ground up, these principles can really, like, basically increase the velocity of innovation. Now, in Shift 4, the business has been around for quite a while. Does it cleanly translate for you? Are you able to take those insights and, like, translate them directly into the business? Or is there a lot of kind of, like, cutting off limbs and, and reconfiguring to accommodate those principles within an operating business? Yeah, I mean, it's harder to do because uh, they, they have had these philosophies for some time. But, I mean, SpaceX has matured a lot over the years, too. So they, they didn't necessarily have it all uh, day one. And they actually only, I mean, SpaceX started only a couple years after, after Shift 4, too. But that said, look, there are definitely clear differences that, you know, set SpaceX apart from virtually any other organization. In fact, two organizations that I was very close to, still close to, between SpaceX and St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, these are very mission, vision driven organizations, you know, not every company, you know, can rally a workforce around making life multi-planetary. At the same time, like you take a St. Jude, you know, mission vision of, you know, uh, no child should die in the dawn of life. You're going to assemble talent that believes that there is no other place they can be in the world to make as much of an impact. That's, you know, a big advantage they have. Some tech, tech organizations get similar benefits but I've never seen such a collection of like talent and expertise, like pure determination, uh, like you see at you know organizations like SpaceX and St. Jude for that matter, and 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 they are kind of in a in a category of their own just based on what they're they're trying to achieve. So that doesn't obviously translate over perfectly. Like you know every decision we make, you know every decision I see they make kind of at SpaceX is does this help get us to Mars? And a lot of it they can monetize along the way. Like Starlink is a great example. We have that, that's going to be how they're going to talk to people on on the moon and Mars. But it's also like a hell of a business opportunity here on Earth. Not every business, you know, you know, comes down to like a simple question or a simple North Star like that that always leads you in the right direction. So they do have some advantages, but but there are absolutely elements that um, you know I've observed their philosophies, their approach that was able to um, kind of port over to Shift Four and and have had you know, measurable results from it. For the Starlink communication to the moon, is the thought there Starlink constellation orbiting the moon or satellites orbiting the Earth pointed upwards? I know part of the Polaris program is going to potentially test the one of the first laser links. How does that work given that it's Earth-centric? And yeah, obviously it's only a few hundred miles up and targeted towards the Earth. Yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll definitely have connectivity via laser, uh, even though we're flying above the constellation. So I know that that is adequate for what we're demonstrating as part of Polaris Dawn. It's one of our three big objectives of that mission. What is the ultimate game plan uh, between, um, you know, for Starlink comms between Earth and, and Mars? Yeah, I mean, I'd probably defer to a lot, lot smarter engineers and such than, than, than myself on that one, but... Yeah, I don't, I don't think you need to have a constellation in lunar orbit in order to affect the connectivity. And then shift four payments. You guys, as, as listening to the uh, Dave Lee podcast that you, you'd done previously, you specialize in complicated payment transactions. You know, do you have the, the team working on being the first payment provider on the moon, multi-planetary? I certainly have... Um, you know, big ambitions, but I, I'd like to think we're pretty disciplined in terms of how we allocate capital. And I don't know if that would be the best, the best use of it right now. But look, 40% of all the hotels in the U.S. use some form of shift for payment technology. So if there is ever a day that there is a hotel in low Earth orbit or, or in the vicinity of the moon, I'd like to think we have a, you know, a right to win at least or a fair shake at it. Can you lay out like the the vision of like why do Polaris or th this next? I call it extension of, of inspiration. What's your, like, in Polaris's intrinsic motivations or mission? I think that also comes back to, uh, you know, one of the, you know, the SpaceX's vision that uh, the world is just a more interesting place when people can journey among the stars. The progress that's been made, you know, since SpaceX, you know, came about is extraordinary, right? I mean, we are seeing things that were exclusive to science fiction, 
until SpaceX pioneered, you know, their self-landing rockets that they do routinely now, which has substantially lowered the cost to access low Earth orbit. You know, it takes private investment dollars to do that. Like, I absolutely believe that private industry and entrepreneurs, um, you know, can allocate capital far more effectively and efficiently than the government can. So, you know, what you have with Polaris is a privately funded space program. And I think the idea is that if Polaris is successful, you're going to have a flight proven starship, a crewed vehicle that works. And if you have that, then you can get to the moon. And if you can get to the moon, the amount of like incremental velocity to get to Mars is, is, is negligible, which means you can, if you can stay alive in that ship long enough to get there, you can get to Mars. So that's pretty exciting. We only have really one crack at this whole thing. So, you know, you want to do good for, for Earth. You want to leave it a better place than you found it, but you, you want to make progress for tomorrow, for the more interesting world that we all want to live in. I guess maybe just say, like, I spent 10 years with building Draken, which is a defense aerospace company, where I saw all the big defense primes, these, like, mega, you know, defense conglomerates. Uh, you know, they don't touch a keyboard without a contract. And then you go to Starbase, Texas, and you see a city that was built essentially with all private funding. NASA wants to reevaluate the, the lunar lander contract, so stop work order. No, they'll just keep doing it because they've been funding it you know, themselves and they'll continue to keep funding it. That's how you're going to have amazing progress, uh, right? Uh, so I think what we're trying to contribute with a, with a private space program is the, you know, it achieves many objectives. Like it de-risks Starship, demonstrates new technology that will be essential for future long-duration space flight. It brings down the costs. Like every dollar we're spending on space flight today helps recoup in initial investment dollars, drives more efficiency through the, uh, you know, regeneration process to make future space flights that much more affordable. So I think it's like a very worthwhile initiative. Um, I think the world stands to, to gain from it if we, if we want to be a spacefaring civilization someday. Well, I, I understand how it helps SpaceX, like, to de-risk its, its, its launch vehicles and stuff. But where does Polaris fit in? Is this like a one-off, we're doing this a few times, and then, you know, just for the good of humanity? Or is there a longer-term vision behind where that might go? I mean, you know, the objectives really are to, you know, undertake a, you know, two, a series or two, you know, minimum Falcon and Dragon tech demonstration flights, prove out new technology that will ultimately be flown on Starship. So you have the first crewed vehicle of Starship, which should be the vehicle that is the 737 of, of human spaceflight. Now, I guess the question is like, well, why doesn't just SpaceX just do it on their own? And I'm sure they would, like they've already invested, you know, heavily. Does it does it take them a year longer or two years longer, you know, in order to get there? I, I, I don't know. I mean, this was jointly kind of created. I was with Elon when we set out the objectives for the first mission, Polaris Dawn, with the idea that this would make progress. Um, and uh, both sides are kind of making investments into it. So I'd like to think that that gets us to the, to the objective that much faster. What is the Polaris side of the, the responsibility set? Polaris is the joint program. So, I mean, you have two crew members from SpaceX, you have two crew members, you know, that, that basically I designated into it. The team that's assembled is, is evaluating all the risk trades. You know, if we go up and do this, then where are we taking on more risk and how are we mitigating that? What do we think will have the most impact for the second mission? Like, these are all being um, done jointly. I mean, I've, obviously a lot of like the the hammer and nails, if you will, like the, the, uh, the modifications to the vehicle, the regeneration of it, the new spacesuits, those are all being manufactured by SpaceX. Um, but we're testing them, you know, we're going underwater in them, we're seeing how they work here, we're giving feedback based on experience we've already had, whether it's from my inspiration for flight, or what we're able to, you know, test here on Earth, and then ultimately what we test and, and, and the data we bring back from on-orbit flights. Have you gathered a lot of interest from others? I feel like what you're doing is is extremely cool and would attract others. I mean, there's like, you know, apparently a lot of people who want to go to space for five minutes. I'd imagine that uh, doing three days would, would maybe be a more intense crowd, but I feel like definitely other enthusiasts out there. Have you seen that or not really? Oh, yeah. I mean, like, I have people that I haven't talked to in, like, 15 years that say, uh, is there any, uh, any seats on the, uh, the next Polaris mission? <laughs> Isn't this what got, gets us all excited when we watch uh, Star Wars or Star Trek or whichever one you're a fan of about, you know, 
exploring the universe, and we're a long way away from being able to do that, but if Starship is operational, we're at least a little bit of a step closer, at least exploring our solar system is potentially in the realm of possible. So yeah, a lot of people reach out and express interest, and that's, that's awesome. And, and look, it actually will be in the reach of many, many more. If Starship can even achieve you know, one-tenth of what Elon expressed during his last update of, you know, 10 million a launch and, you know, reusability within a matter of hours. I mean, it can fit 100 people. There's more habitable volume on Starship than the entirety of the International Space Station. And that took 20, 20 years and numerous launches to assemble. And they're building a lot of them. So, yeah, I mean, you actually have, like, the real potential to, to open up for everyone. But you, you have to start somewhere. And uh, I think what we're trying to accomplish on these missions isn't, isn't meant to be a you know, an open call similar to what, you know, what we did with Inspiration4, where the objective was showing that it could be done. This will be five days on orbit. There's a lot that's, um, you know, going to be different about this, these missions than, than Inspiration4, but, but the future will be pretty awesome if it, if it all works out really well. So. And you mentioned, like, you know, these basically private enterprises required to capitalize these types of initiatives, which, which I agree with. And it's hard you know, Sam's job and, and my job partly is to like think of all the crazy things that can happen out of the fact that we have reusable rockets and with reusable rockets in particular, it's kind of like, yes, it would be good for the world for life to be multi-planetary, but it's not as clear how you could privately capitalize such a venture unless, you know, SpaceX can make so much money off Starlink that they can inject that capital successfully in, into sending you know missions out there if you had to guess what business models arise from reusable rockets are there additional business models you can think of or is it kind of like you just need to make the leap and start a colony your question is the right one right um you better have like a starlink and a lot of resources to pay for a trip to mars because I'm not quite sure exactly when we get there um what the the economy is to justify the extraordinary Manhattan Project level investment to do so, other than it's probably a good thing for humankind in, in the super grand scheme of things, right? But every single thing that SpaceX builds along the way can be monetized and opens up new opportunities. Like right now, the KPI is just, you know, your cost uh, per kilogram uh, accelerating it to orbit. It's dropped a lot thanks to SpaceX. Like it can drop materially. And once you do that, you really don't know what is in the realm of possible, right? I, I don't think you're going to have, like, these massive tourist flights of people on starships taking pictures, you know, going from point A to B in, you know, 45 minutes. I, I don't think that's, that's what the economy is. Do I, I do think people will be working in low-Earth orbit. I do think you can have a manufacturing capability in low-Earth orbit. I think you can expand science. I mean, geez, the list is, like, is probably 10 miles long for getting experiments on the International Space Station. They have to be super selective of what goes up. There's only so many people that can even manage the experiments up there. When you can bring down costs, like, materially to the point where, let's just say, you know, biotechs and pharmaceutical companies can afford it, you don't know what's potentially possible, right? I mean, we've come a very long way, you know, from the infrastructure investments to allow rich Wall Street types to have a car phone in the 1980s, what, like, mobile mobile technology has to offer to the world today, uh, where it's not uncommon for like your average 12 year old to have a smartphone and, and buy a bunch of apps and such. So like you gotta get that cost down or you're, you're gonna just limit the amount of possibilities that happen. Starship is gonna be a total game changer in the ability to put mass and accelerate into orbit. And from there, you know, again, it's just, there's, there's so many possibilities that could come from it. Are you thinking low G manufacturing for like actually to bring product back to earth? Is that what you're implying? Or just to create more, I guess, infrastructure and tooling for outbound exploration? Well, look, I, I'd say like the moment you create, you know, low cost mass production capabilities of starships, almost to the point that they could, you know, even though they're reusable, they could almost essentially be disposable too. And that you could put up 20 of them and just dock them and have essentially like a city uh, in low earth orbit if every one of them has the potential of maybe like its high density configuration is 100, so let's just say it's like 20, you could really populate a lot of people on orbit. Then what are they doing up there? Like what was worth the investment? Well, first, we don't know if it was actually even that big of an investment at that point in time. It might actually be like very reasonable to get up there. And then what, be what can you accomplish in microgravity better than what you could potentially do, you know, here on Earth? I think that remains to be seen because you've just had so 
so little opportunities to test up there. I mean, again, it's only a select few experiments periodically make their way up to the International Space Station. But we'll find out, right? I mean, we, we certainly weren't going to find out when it was $250 million every time you put a, a satellite up. Um, but now we've got CubeSats up, and it's just, it's, it's just changing quite rapidly. But I agree with you, like, fundamentally, we have to answer the question on, like, what that economy looks like in order to justify some of the more, like, extraordinary investments. But fortunately, like, it's not like SpaceX is oblivious to this either. Like, that's where Starlink does come in. And I would say they will be the, the category leader in payload to low Earth orbit for uh, quite some time. To me, it seems as if for, you have to cross, cross some kind of price threshold for Mars. I think Elon said this, where it's basically somebody can give up on Earth, sell their house, and try to become a colonist and make their fortune on the march. And so, so there is you know, some like taking of capital in the U.S. that would go into people like paying for the journey out there, even if it's a one-way trip, but we're still a long way. Yeah, I don't even, I prefer to just keep it at the, uh, let's just reduce the cost of getting mass to low Earth orbit and let the possibilities kind of span from there. Because once you start talking about, like SpaceX can't solve everything for Mars. And believe me, long before somebody's selling their house here and deciding to like colonize Mars, there are social and psychological issues that you know have not been sorted out yet space just even low earth orbit could come with a lot of stress i mean physiologically everyone 100 percent people feel different when you're on orbit and there have been challenges throughout human spaceflight uh and you're essentially call it uh hours from coming home safely from the space station you're two and a half days uh to come home safely from the moon you're nine months every couple of years to come home from mars and it is a spec like long before we figure out how people are going to make a living uh, on Mars, we have to make sure they don't lose their mind on Mars uh, as well. So there's a lot that needs to be figured out. And it's, again, it's, it, it, SpaceX can't solve all these things. But believe me, once we start shifting the conversation there, there's a, there's a lot of you know, questions to still be solved. And there's no analogs here on Earth or throughout human history. Like you can not, not crossing the Atlantic uh, during the, you know, the Renaissance or the Age of Exploration, not Antarctica. Like there are no, there are no analogs. Fitting, Brett, to what you're saying, I think just today they, they found Shackleton's ship, Endurance. So similar journey, as, as uh, Musk has put it. In a way, though, right? Because, um, you know, you have water, you can fish. You know, if you came across the Atlantic, you generally know that with wood, you can build a, a house. And if you're successful trading anything, you can reward yourself by maybe building a bigger house. Um, you know, you can buy more cattle. Like there are some things that are just totally like for like, even if you're going into a strange land on here on earth, you could spend your whole life on Mars um, doing what's in the best interest of the, of the colony and you still live in your same dome. You're not gonna go outside and chop down more trees to build yourself a nicer dome. There are no real analogs, uh, you know, kind of whatsoever, but that doesn't mean it shouldn't, uh, it shouldn't stop us from you know, taking these kind of bold steps that are, are probably, again, in the best interest of humankind. Is this kind of cautionary tone uh, inspired by your Inspiration4 mission? Did you almost lose your mind while you were in orbit? Oh, no. I'm quite sure, like, uh, we, we were pretty well monitored. Uh, like, psychological training was part of it. Uh, I'm quite sure they would not allow me back up if I did. No, I, I'm actually just kind of just, you know, sharing from my, my education experience, and it is that... Um, uh, I mean, 50% of people have uh, space adaptation syndrome on orbit. It uh, doesn't matter you, who you are. You could be a great fighter pilot and fly upside down all the time, and you won't feel so great for a bit. Um, and throughout the entire duration on orbit, just based on lack of gravity and fluid shifts, you feel different. So it's not the same as, you know, taking off an airplane and kind of clearing the pressure, you know, build up and, uh, and everything's fine. It's, uh, it's a little bit uh, different. But it's not meant to like slow down progress. It's actually just more meant to highlight the things that need consideration while we're in parallel, while SpaceX, uh, you know, brings all this fun sci-fi back to, to reality. What was the least enjoyable aspect of it? Coming home. <laughs> I say that in a way like if we could have stayed a day or two days more. I mean, for, you know, Polaris Dawn will be a five-day mission, but... Um, yeah, I mean, you just felt so fortunate to be there, and you just wanted to maximize every every single second of it. So, yeah, there was a little bit of a disappointment factor when you come home. But then you can do what you know what I'm doing now, which is kind of share the experience and kind of educate a little bit on everything that we stand to to learn. It is one of the things that we are trying to brainstorm uh, to what we were discussing is what is the minimum amount of weight or mass that you'd need to start a self-sustaining city. 
maybe too early too too early for for that modeling maybe not but it yeah that's one of the things we've batted around on how do you start dimensioning uh that or if by the time you know it's actually applicable are you not truly that mass limited uh because you have the capability to send so many up yeah I, look the, that is a, i guarantee you like one of those questions that you know elon would just be able to fire off an answer like instantly and it would make tons of sense uh i'm not even uh, not even close close to venturing a guess on that okay it's slightly different angle it seems like there's a there's a a trend in kind of like multi-talented entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs doing multiple things at the same time let's say you fall into that you're leading shift four and you're also going into space which seems like a little bit of key man risk but you know you landed safely like why is that happening and also do, does that you know, how do you juggle kind of those responsibilities and, and kind of your leadership of that organization with what you're doing in the space side? Yeah, I mean, well, there has to be a limit, too. Um, and I think that's, you know, kind of based on every individual, and how, I don't know, effective they are at managing their responsibilities. I mean, clearly, Elon's limit's a lot different than the rest of ours. He's like CEO of five companies, I think. I mean, I was uh, the CEO of two companies for, you know, 10 years, you know, which was Draken and Shafor. I sold Draken, uh you know, specifically because I knew we were going public and, uh, and that would have come with it additional responsibilities. But I did feel like I, uh, I learned an awful lot throughout that 10 years on things that I never would have had exposure to, you know, at Shift 4. And, you know, whatever time I was able to free up in order to, you know, kind of, um, you know, participate in Inspiration 4 and the education process associated with it, I learned a lot. And, and Shift 4 is a better, a better company because of it right now. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, probably a lot of entrepreneurs uh, love the challenge. Uh, I know I certainly do. Um, you get attracted to things where you see opportunity. And then that's where you got to kind of make that call of, am I, am I about to spread myself too, th too thin to the detriment of, of all my uh, endeavors? Or, or can I effectively manage both? And will both organizations be stronger because of it? And I certainly feel like that's been the case throughout throughout my history, where I, where I did juggle more than just my shift four responsibilities. And again, I have absolutely no, no doubt what I took back from, you know, my experience at, uh, with Inspiration4 and exposure to SpaceX had a, have, has had and will continue to have a direct benefit to Shift4. Do you think it's different for, like, uh, private versus public companies? What has your experience been like being, you know, in charge of Shift4 when it's private versus, you know, having to answer to public shareholders? And, and do you think that imposes an additional burden that kind of makes it harder to pursue those outside interests? I mean, I think, you know, um, I was given some flexibility that maybe other, uh, you know, public company CEOs wouldn't have. I mean, you know, I'm the founder. I still own a third of the company, uh, so I'm the largest shareholder, and I have a track record of being able to, you know, juggle responsibilities without taking off, without, you know, biting off more than I can handle and exiting those responsibilities when, when the times were appropriate. So I think I'm given uh, some degree of, of latitude on that. There's no doubt there's a lot more scrutiny because you have a lot more shareholders. <laughs> and when times are good, no one will care about any of it. And when times are bad, you're going to look for any reason you can. And like, oh, he was distracted. He was in space or something it might be one of the reasons. Then that becomes like kind of a non-event when the entire sector catches on fire. So as we, we've kind of seen over the last four or five months, that, that maybe it wasn't any one uh, particular person's decisions. But yeah, look, I mean, you have a lot more people to answer to, for sure. And uh, I would say just in general, like, there are tons of advantages for being a public company. I'm, like, thrilled that we, we were able to pull it off. I mean, we went, we're a payments company with, like, a third share of restaurants and hotels, and we IPO'd in, you know, June of 2020 in a pandemic. Um, that's pretty lucky. It's given us the ability to expand into seven new verticals, expand our geographic coverage area, to raise low-cost capital, to delever. Like, all of that is worth whatever amount of time I have to spend once a quarter talking to you analysts, investors. I generally, it's the same comment everybody probably has that like it does, you know, the drawback of having to manage, you know, some of your decision making and investments on a quarter by quarter basis kind of is what it is. Everybody would say the same, I'm sure. Easier to yeah, juggle as a private company with less, less shareholders, sure. What about, what about like the kind of employee reaction to slash the recursion of like stock price decline and then the employees feel like things are worse than maybe they are. Do you feel that pressure as well? Or, or is it more related to like interface with public shareholders? No, it's certainly there too, for sure. Um, 
I mean, I think we went public at just such an unusual time, right? I mean, you know, we pendulum swung from, you know, prior to the IPO where you're like, well, if payment, you know, if lockdowns persist and payment volumes down 80%, you know, for a prolonged period of time, then, you know, you just run out of cash. So that's pretty scary. Then the IPO and before you know it, you're like trading at 55 times, you know, next year's EBITDA. And you're like, maybe this just is the new norm. And then like you, within like, 18 months of that, you correct back to there's no such thing as revenue multiples anymore, and um, you know 10 times seems like a norm. That's quite a roller coaster for anyone. And every one of our employees, we have 2,000, they're all shareholders. We did huge uh, change of control stock uh, awards at the time of the IPO. We've since expanded it to every grade within the in, within the uh, the company. So uh, I'm sure that weighed on people's minds. Now, when everything trades off, and you have you know Omicron, and you have uh, you know, geopolitical um, tensions like we're seeing now in a horrible humanitarian crisis. I think, you know, it, your employees know that this is not an us thing, that this is, you know, the world is not in a healthy place, but the world, you know, overcomes and things will be better again and we just got to keep executing. So, yeah, but I mean, sure, it's another consideration you have that you wouldn't have as a private company where you can't monitor the valuation on a day to day basis. Because the way, I mean, one of the things we've been talking about and struggling with, if you look at private companies relative to public right now, and, and some of it, there's a, a laggard effect in private fundraising, but they're still raising at, at really, call it aggressive valuations relative to public. And I wonder about the, the employees within those private companies where maybe if they're getting compensated on those heightened valuations, like in some way, you know, it, we work when it fell apart, the person... It clearly, Adam Newman didn't come out bad out of that deal, but the employees did, right? And so it's in some ways kind of being private allows you to be less honest with the employees as to what's going on. And they just see the headlines, so they're not aware that there's like a ratchet mechanism in there. So if they go public, that it just drags everything down. Maybe it got exasperated over the last couple of years, but that's existed before. I mean, you know, like we've seen companies struggle and, you know, can't afford to take a down round and then... Um, you know, it falls apart. Like it just happens in periods of exuberance in the market, right? Yeah. And I'm not saying that the companies raising privately are necessarily going to fall apart right now. Was it from the employee base? How did the employee base feel about the prospects of going public? Did you feel kind of, were they agitating for that at all? Or is just, oh, this seems like a nice thing to do? Like what was the it shift for? What was the employee base thinking as they went through the process? I think it was immense relief. I mean, you know, we're a 22-year-old company, 20 years, we finally go public, you know, it feels like, you know, we, we made it to the big leagues. We're an organization that loves that kind of challenge. I mean, I, I refer to challenge a lot. Like, that's a big motivator is to kind of play on a bigger and badder stage, you know, listing on the New York Stock Exchange during, like, one of the harshest climates that you can imagine for our end markets. Um, first company to ring the bell at the stock exchange uh, after the pandemic began like that. I think a lot of people, there was relief. I think they took pride in it. I think they were incredibly excited about all the things we were able to do coming out of it, believing we should be a more diverse, bigger and stronger organization and got to see some incredible highs, like euphoric highs, and then quite the opposite in a very short period of time. So, so that part sucked, but I, I would say like you didn't ask any one of the, like, the employees, it'd be much much happier that we did what we did when we did, and that the good far, far outweighs the bad. Also in a space that's experiencing, I mean, payments, but generally kind of financial ecosystem, experiencing a lot of kind of tumult, upheaval, strategic shifts. How do you think about, and I know you've made some investments in, in the cryptocurrency side of things. How do you think about the strategic landscape within the payment space, given all the cross currents that, that are occurring? Well, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I talk to investors all the time, especially over the last five months, about a lot of confusion, I'd say even at periods of time, just general panic about fintech and commerce, like just who's winning, who's losing. And, you know, I mean, two years ago, there were only a handful of public fintech players. Now there's a bunch, plus a well, uh, a, you know, the SPACs brought a number of them to market, plus a number of well-known high profile private players like Stripe and such that's out there. And just general confusion. You know, and what I'd say is like, first of all, there can be plenty of payment companies. Like the commerce across the world is enormous. And, you know, there are new emerging markets that open up all the time. So like 
one payment company that you know uh, IPO'd a year and a half ago, you know, focuses on international education and travel related payments. Like these were all handled with wire payments before. So like the fact that you're, you know, there's anxiety about like where does this company fit in with the square or something. It's like, look, people still get their cups of coffee in the morning. They still go to the like food truck and now parents are paying tuitions on credit cards sometimes, especially like internationally, and that's not something to panic over. There is a lot of commerce in the world. There's a lot of different, uh, a lot of different verticals, a lot of different markets. Some of them are merging, didn't even exist before with, with card-based payments. So like, don't panic just because there's a lot of names. Uh, you want to figure out who's winning and losing. Generally, just look at volume trends. There's a lot of payments companies that don't report volume anymore. It's pretty much the most important KPI I can think of in payments. So if you're not, you're probably losing. If you're if you're adding a lot of volume, then you're, you're probably winning. And in terms of like what could catch you off guard, whether AP alternative payment methods or crypto, uh, look, I, I think it's just very important to understand it. And um, if you can get passionate about uh, where it makes sense and you don't have to have a, you know, uh, like 20 different miracles to happen in order for it to become prevalent or, or profitable, then you should probably lean into it. And if it seems like, you know, the risk reward equation isn't necessarily there, then you can be cautious and, and observe. We acquired a, you know, a crypto company called the Giving Block because it was very easy to get your arms around it. You didn't have to believe a lot. Like there's going to be crypto out there. It'll, it'll probably grow with some degree of popularity. It'll appreciate in value over some period of time. And then people will probably want to donate it. And nonprofits will probably have no clue on how to take it. That's all you need to believe there. Um, that's not, um, you know, anywhere near as radical as maybe some of the other, you know, crypto stories, which it's like, wow, that's fascinating. I want to keep an eye on it, but I may not be willing to risk any of my balance sheet on it yet, you know. So is it fair to say that I shouldn't interpret you're trying to get literally physically as far away from headquarters as possible after IPOing as a kind of um, commentary on the competitive landscape in fintech? Is that right? I used three days of my uh, vacation time and I had plenty of it banked. I love what I do. Shift 4 is awesome. If we were standing still, you know, that would bother me because it is, it is the challenge that, that is a big motivator for myself, my awesome leadership team, the employees. And we went from focusing on restaurants and hotels to stadiums, theme parks, wagering, specialty retail, airlines, nonprofit. And then we just expanded, you know, I promised the company like 15 years ago, we're going to go international. I was long overdue, but now we just acquired a European cross-border e-commerce platform. So we can kind of take what's grown for us, worked really well for us in the U.S. and go in new markets. Like all of this is, you know, it's, it's intellectually stimulating. It's challenging. And as long as it stays that way, I, I, I couldn't, you know, imagine my interest really anywhere else. So. Do you think it's a coincidence that like fintech guys end up going into space? I'm calling Bezos also fintech because of one-click payments, but is that just like total random coincidence or it's just because it's a way to make money and then we can spend money in space? Or? No, I think it's just pure fascination. I think it's, it's human nature. I think this is why we cross oceans. This is why we climb mountains. I think it's the challenge. It's the opportunity to answer questions we've been thinking about since the beginning of humankind. Like, I think that's what's the motivation. I also think, like, having some good sense along the way, too. You know, entrepreneurs, you know, the more successful ones have a knack for finding opportunity. You know, Elon surveyed the landscape and said, okay, there's, there's one company that's doing this. It's a jobs program. It's a joint venture between Lockheed and Boeing. Well, that doesn't sound inexpensive to me. So, you know, I probably, like, on top of, like, just fulfilling a, a fantasy and, um, you know, and again, kind of an, almost an instinct to want to explore, there's probably a hell of a revenue opportunity here too, a, a great business model. And I think that's the case for sure. So I don't think it has to do with, you know, where, you know, rich people want to just deploy capital. I think there's a lot more to it that is, you know, can check any number of boxes. Yeah, I guess I'm kind of like that last point you made is maybe a little interesting to me in that, because I'm thinking... Elon out of out of PayPal or what X.com or whatever he had. And so maybe it's like the, the, the fintech story broadly is, hey, there's all of these banks that have kind of monopoly, regulatory monopolies that aren't operating in, a, in an agile way and we can fill in the gaps. And then on the space side, it's kind of the same thing. You have the cost plus contractors who are basically have a, a government relationship monopoly and maybe we can fill in the crap cracks by by not cozying up in the same way or is that too much a stretch 
I don't know if I would make, necessarily tie it out in that way. I think you just have two in the case of Bezos and, um, and Elon. I think you just have visionary entrepreneurs here that know that um, in the grand scheme of things, we just know so little about our universe and that they have the resources and means to potentially do something about it. And I think they obviously arrived at two very different business models serving different markets. Um, obviously a bigger fan of the orbital one myself. I think you're just coincidence on like the, the fintech side, if you ask me. I do think there's a difference between though how, you know, businesses like Elon's were at times like I think under, you know, a lot of stress uh, to achieve profitability and didn't have necessarily access to capital that maybe influenced the more scrappy, you know, fail fast, get it done, you know, the capital might not be there tomorrow approach that SpaceX has had, which is, I think, driven incredible results for the amount of capital invested versus, and I'm not like picking sides here necessarily in this, but, you know, there, there's definitely remarkable progress on SpaceX relative to where, where Blue Origin's at. And I don't think Amazon necessarily was in, they definitely had a lot more opportunity to get where they needed to go, right? And I think the same, the same is true. You know, you take that same exact thing, you go to the EV market, you know, Tesla versus Amazon's investment into Rivian, right? Being, being capital constrained definitely drives innovation in a way that uh, having unlimited capital doesn't. Then on to some quick wrap up questions. You're a pilot, astronaut. Are checklists a part of your everyday life? Yeah, uh, totally. Um, and not enough. Um, so like, that's one of the big things I've been, uh, beating the drum on and being procedurally driven. Uh, SpaceX is immensely procedurally driven. Like they are like almost robots sometimes when they're in a room talking about things, they have a whole EPROC procedure system. And again, it comes down to like a lot of smart people not wasting brain power on things they've already figured out before that you could just sail through if you just essentially follow a decision tree or checklist. Right? So obviously I have a great appreciation for checklists as a pilot. But I looked around our organization, I'm like, wow, we are exercising so much creative freedom and using so much bandwidth and resources on things that we already figured out 10 years ago. Why isn't this just like a super scripted out process? We can optimize it and then ideally we can automate it at some point in time in a very, very SpaceX-like uh, philosophy. So yeah, huge believer in it, obviously in, in its aviation context, but certainly across business too. What's on your daily personal checklist? It's updated quite a bit, but I mean, it would be these days, there's been an awful lot of investor discussions, I could say, especially after two acquisitions, but it's generally a split between all the things that I, we need to accomplish like day-to-day -day operationally and then what are in support of our kind of strategic plan. Um, it varies by the day. And then favorite book? Uh, Liftoff, uh, the SpaceX story. Uh, I don't know. I'm very big on space books these days. So I just finished up uh, Mercury Rising, um, which I thought was you know, really good. Was there downtime uh, on the Inspiration4 mission? What, what was that like? Were you just like, all right, we're, we're done looking at the stars today. We're done with the experiments. Like, I'm going to pull out my Kindle and uh, just read a bit. What, what was the downtime situation? No, they're really, first I'll tell you, like, time just melts away. We did a 30-hour sim here on Earth, uh, and uh, it felt like six hours, and the same thing was the case uh, in space. Like, uh, everything is scripted out by literally the minute because you have only certain windows of comm coverage, certain windows of video coverage, certain things you want to get done uh, when you're not in eclipse. Uh, so just time just disappears really quick. But I will say they build in uh, about an extra 90 minutes before liftoff in case there's any, you know, contingency that comes up. That you want to troubleshoot so not to screw with your timeline. And then similarly, before the deorbit sequence begins, there's about 90 minutes as well. So in the 90 minutes of downtime where we were just literally strapped in and waiting before launch, we started uh, playing the score from Star Wars. And then for about 20 minutes in that gap before re-entry, we, uh, we queued up um, space balls on our, on our uh, flight iPads, uh, which I thought was just, just kind of humorous. But. A, a classic. And then uh, you obviously, you know, challenges drive you. You've conquered many challenges. What's your white whale? What's, what is a challenge you've uh, attempted to achieve in the past but haven't and are, are still seeking to achieve it? There's a lot. Um, I strike out quite a bit. Well, look, I, I kind of said it earlier on the call, like uh, one of our ambitions for about 15 years at Shift 4 was, um, was to expand internationally. And that is one that uh, it took a really long time to come to fruition. We did that recently. I think the other one is like, I always felt like I didn't, I haven't contributed or served uh, enough. It's almost like a regret uh, 
you know, kind of giving back to the to the country that has afforded you know me a lot of the opportunities. And you know, I don't consider like Drakken's contributions to be close to that, and I don't consider really philanthropic ones. So there's been various periods of time where I wished I could have done more, and maybe that'll be in a, another chapter. Great. Well, Jared, thank you so much for joining us today. And, you know, maybe we'll, we'll circle back after uh, Larry's Dawn. Yeah, really appreciate it. Thanks. Um, yeah, thanks so much for inviting me to this. ARC believes that the information presented is accurate and was obtained from sources that ARC believes to be reliable. However, ARC does not guarantee the accuracy or completeness of any information, and such information may be subject to change without notice from ARC. Historical results are not indications of future results. Certain of the statements contained in this podcast may be statements of future expectations and other forward-looking statements that are based on ARC's current views and assumptions and involve known and unknown risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results, performance, or events to differ materially from those expressed or implied in such statements.